Today I'm going to show you how to make a waterproof heater. Uh, I'm not going to actually show you the construction of the heater itself, but what I'm going to do is show you a heater that, that, uh, that meets my requirements and then make it fully submersible in water-based solutions. Now, there's a lot of reasons why you'd need a heater like this. Uh, the main reason that I can think of um, off the top of my head is to make a small hot tanking operation. It would work even on a, a medium scale hot tank too, but say if you're just cleaning small parts, at some point in time you're going to need a hot tank. Now even if you have a solvent tank to get rid of grease and oil, which they, they work best for that, uh, a lot of times there'll be other crud on parts that solvent tanks won't remove because it's not oil based. And that's where a hot tank comes in. This is the main reason I want to show you this is so you can make a small heater and have a small hot tanking setup. And later on in the video, I'll, I'll give you a very simple recipe on uh, you know what I use to clean parts. To do this, I'm going to be using a a uh, small cartridge heater. Uh, this is not waterproof. This is for dry use only. Unfortunately. Uh, I mean, these are very good heaters, but unfortunately, they're not waterproof. In fact, this is magnesium oxide, so if you would put this in a, a bucket of acid solution or a caustic solution uh, or any just, just plain water, what would happen is it would go down inside there and short this out and ruin the entire heater. So these are readily available. They're very easy to get, and they're very powerful, too. This is a 1,000-watt unit. It's good up to um, 1,400 degrees. Of course, it won't be getting to that temperature because it will be going inside a water-based solution. To seal off this cartridge heater, what I'm going to use is a piece of heat shrink tubing. Now, this, is, this isn't just any sort of heat shrink tubing. This is called moisture seal. And what it has is a layer of, it's like a hot glue type of sealant inside. Whenever you shrink this on with heat, uh, that melts and completely goes around the part you're trying to seal up. And I also have a uh, boot here, an end cap, it's completely closed on the end. And this, is also, this also has a moisture seal on it too, so when you heat it up, it's going to seal off the bottom end of this. Now this is going to go on the top here. You want this exposed here so, it's, so it doesn't overheat inside the uh, water. And I'm going to seal off about that much wire. Just enough so no acid has any chance of getting running down this wire and going into the top of this heater. It's a real simple operation here, but if you've tried to find one of these commercially, uh, you can find the aquarium heaters, and they just don't have the wattage, and they don't go up to the temperatures you need. Like if you're anodizing and sealing dye, uh, you know, you need to go up around 200 degrees Fahrenheit to seal dye, and you're not going to find an aquarium heater, at least I hope, that can go up to 200 degrees. So let's go ahead and get this measured up and find out what length we need. Uh, and start sealing this off. Okay, first off, we're going to mark this. Nothing exact about this. It's just a rough measurement. And um, let's see, how do we want to do this? Put it there so you can see it. And I'm going to leave it about, I'm only going to have this covering about a half inch at the top, but this stuff tends to shrink in length also a little bit. So I'm going to leave a little bit of margin uh, in case it shrinks on here, I can trim it off afterward. That's no big deal. It's real easy to trim. And bring this up here. Try to hang on to that. Bring it a couple inches above that junction there. And then cut this. Lost my mark. Okay, that's good. Now, uh, now what I need to do is clean this off, first of all. And put that down through that piece of shrink tubing. It's going to get kind of difficult after a while there. So I'm going to use a wooden dowel rod here to assist it all the way down through that tubing. There, it's out the other end. So now what I'm going to do Bring it up to that mark.
You see how it's starting to shrink already. And as it does that, it'll start squeezing that adhesive out onto the metal. It's a, it's, it comes out clear too. It looks a lot like hot glue. Now I'm gonna start heating this section. This stuff's good till about 300 degrees, but you don't want to, um, you don't want to go crazy because this heat gun will uh, burn it if you're not careful. You also want to be careful not to burn the vinyl underneath on the uh, insulation of the wire. Now that should about do it. Now, <clears throat> it's still warm, so this can still be formed. So you want to straighten it out, or any deformities, you want to straighten that out before it cools off and hardens up. It's still very pliable at this point. At least it's pliable enough. Now I'm going to take another measurement here from the bottom. Now this cap will take up some space too, so I'm going to take another measurement, 14 inches, and uh, that's good. About 14 and a half, that's fine. Now while it's still cool, I'm going to heat this up again a little bit. Heat up this area. I'm going to bend this around like so. Just like that. Don't go don't go crazy and, you know, grab the top and just do a sharp corner like that. Just a, a general radius is fine. Now, once this uh, cools down and hardens up, this will serve as a hook for the top of your bucket. So, I'm going to let that cool down a little bit. Okay. And while that's cooling down, I want to show you something else here. Now this, this uh, is a very good heater, but it needs to have a controller on it. Uh, you can't just plug it in like that and let it go because it will boil the water. So you need a controller, and here's a controller that I recommend. I, I have a couple of these now, and, and I really like these things. Now if you get on Amazon or eBay, you'll find a lot of temperature controllers for refrigeration or heating. But what I found is you need to get a separate thermocouple, and you need a uh, separate separate wiring, whether it's uh, you know male or female wiring, you have to buy everything separately and hook it up. And these things are 15 or 20 bucks and some of the reviews are mixed so I don't know about the reliability. But when you're dealing with something with chemicals and they need to be a certain temperature, you need to have, to have something that's pretty reliable, very reliable actually. And this unit here is by Johnson Controls and they've been at this game a long time. So I recommend getting this. They give you a thermocouple, they give you the power plug for the unit. They also give you the, um, the power takeoff, if you want to call it that, a female plug that will, the heater will plug into. And the, the controller here is very simple. I mean, it comes with a manual, but it's a simple setup. They have a simple setup and then they have uh, more of a in-depth setup because it has a lot of features that you can use on it, like uh, differentials and delays, things of that nature and you can set it up for refrigeration or heating and I have it set up this one here for one bath I'm using uh, from 105 degrees to 110 degrees Fahrenheit very reliable it never fails and I highly recommend it and I think this unit when I bought it here last year I think it was between 60 and 70 dollars now I realize that's more expensive but it's a turnkey unit you don't have to worry about it and it, you know it's going to be reliable. Uh, between that and this cartridge heater, this cartridge heater runs about $40 or $42 I think for McMaster car. Um, that and the heat shrink tubing, this is not much at all. You're only talking a few dollars for the heat shrink tubing. Um, and this end cap I think was $1.50. So, you know, so you're going to have a nice setup for heating water or whatever. Okay, that's cooled down enough. Before I forget here, 
I'm going to put this moisture seal cap on this end. You do that until you see the sealant coming out. The sealant on this is black. Not that that matters any, but now you know it's sealed because there's a black ring around that. I'm going to let that cool off now. Uh, that's pretty much it. Now, I'm going to let this cool down a little bit more and trim this uh, off to about half inch. Then we're going to put it in the bucket of water and see how it performs. Now I'll show you how easy this is to use. Okay, this thing's ready to go here. So, you see how I made that hook at the top. So when you put it in the bucket, it goes right down almost to the bottom. So that's, that's pretty simple. So let's get this set up here. Uh, I'm going to be using the Johnson controller. And now I have to do something with this thermocouple. The thermocouple, you just can't dip it in the water because it's not waterproof either. Uh, so what I typically do is I just tape it to the side of a bucket. Alright, now simply take the thermocouple and tape it to the side of the bucket like that. So you see I have the thermocouple taped on there very simply. And a, this is just commonly available uh, bubble wrap insulation. Wrap that around there to uh, help with energy savings. Okay, now what I need to do is plug in this controller. Okay, I got that plugged in. It's going to sit there in setup mode. It's going to uh, tell you what the water temperature is right now, or the air temperature, depending on where you have the thermocouple. And then it'll switch on. So I'm going to plug this in here. And uh, put the new heater to work. It'll take about a minute for this thing to switch on. It's a little yellow light on here whenever this thing's in power mode. And uh, you'll hear the relay click on. It just did. It, it's on now. Now the he heating element is powered up. Now the exposed surface there, the sheathing on that uh, heater is actually Inconel, which is like a type of stainless steel on steroids. It's the same sort of material they use in jet engine blades, uh, turbine blades, and it's it keeps high strength at high temperature. It's very resistant to oxidation or chemical attack. So this is something, uh, this is what they use in submersible acid resistant heaters. Only they're much, much more expensive, hundreds of dollars for these things, but they use the same material. Okay, here we have 69 degrees. It went up from 63 up to 69 already uh, within just me talking here. It's up to 70 degrees from 63 degrees in just a few minutes. I also want to tell you uh, a very simple recipe for uh, your hot tanking solution. It's, you can get it at the grocery store. And for a while I was using electrosol powder and then I couldn't find it anymore so I started using Cascade Gel and uh, it works great. Now the Cascade gel that I was using had sodium hydroxide in it, uh, sodium metabisulfite, and I think some bleach, and sodium carbonate. Now they probably have changed that by now because they keep changing these things because in, in, I don't, who knows why, but they just keep changing this. But Cascade gel was working very well for me. I was using it in a ratio of two cups of gel to two gallons of water. Now that's a lot of detergent. Actually you could probably get away with half of that but that's just what I was using. And then I would heat that up to just below boiling to get a little bit of circulation in the water and I'll tell you what that cleaned off everything. Um, you know mud, it would just take, it would take, you would even turn carbon deposits white and turn them into like a white soft powder. I don't know how or why but it did. Uh, so it, it's a very good solution. Now when it comes to heavier grease it worked too but that tends to use up your hot tanking solution. For heavier grease and stuff I just use a solvent tank, get that off of there, let it dry off and then throw it in the hot tank to get all the rest of the dirt off. It just falls off. It even removes some paint too. Not all but some. Uh, so that's the, the recipe uh, and there's of course when you're using that if you happen to use anything with sodium hydroxide in it be very careful with aluminum. You know, if 
if you can do it, I hate to even say that because people are going to say, you know, I put my aluminum parts in there and they dissolved. Uh, uh, keep in mind, uh, sodium hydroxide dissolves aluminum. Uh, now, I haven't had an issue with it because I was only soaking it, you know, maybe two, three hours at a time. But keep in mind, you have to keep a close watch on it, especially at high temperatures. I don't know how much lye is in cascade gel. I'm thinking it's not a whole lot. But, you know, just keep that in mind. There are aluminum safe hot tanking solutions out there, like Silver Seal is what I use. Uh, if you're using Cascade, just, just be very careful to keep an eye on your parts because it will eat them, uh, which is, if you know, if you have customers' parts in there, they don't like it when you tell them you dissolved their parts. So just keep that in mind. Uh, try Silver Seal. There's different, I think, mm, I can't think of it, no, Oakite or something like that it's called too. I'm not real familiar with all the hot tanking solutions. So anyway, that's just one. Try it out. Uh, it works great on cast iron and steel parts too. So, okay, I've rambled on long enough here. Um, you have all the information you need here to start a cleaning tank. Um, so, you know, get your, get your stuff together and get to it. And let me know how it worked out for you. And I will be seeing you next video.